dear students, this is Professor Carver again, and today we are going to um, really talk um, in very uh, simplest way about the respiratory system. And all what I want to talk about is what I want you to understand uh, in regarding the anatomy of the respiratory system and the, and the mechanism of the respiratory system. So let's get started. All right, what's the function of a respiratory system? You know, when you're breathing and it's very dry air, it will protect you to not bring this dry air to not hurt your respiratory system, your lung and your, uh, your uh, passageway. Uh, and also it will protect against uh, debris uh, and you also pathogens and also protect against any temperature change. We need uh, very hot hair. It will make sure that we humidify this hair, air coming inside of your lung. And also produce a sound and detect odors and uh, because of those uh, uh, olfactory receptors that exist in your nasal cavity. So the upper Respiratory system is made of the nose, nasal cavity, sinuses, and the pharynx. That's the upper respiratory system. We will go in detail to each uh, structures. And the lower respiratory system, it's the larynx, trachea, and the lung. All right? The nose. It's um, the nose is uh, separated by the nasal septum into left and right side, and the anterior pair portion is yelling uh, cartilage. Remember, yelling cartilage is uh, it's to keep uh, the airway open. So we need things that allow you to have the air in is made of um, yelling cartilage. Uh, it supports the dorsum of the nose and the apex of the nose. All right, and the superior portion of the nasal cavity uh, is uh, uh, this is where the olfactory receptors exist. All right, so we have the sagittal um, uh, structure sections of the nasal uh, uh, the nose. If we remove the nasal septum, is made of uh, the concave. We have the superior the middle and the inferior concave, and those is to humidify the, the air and uh, also bring um, the olfactory stimuli to the olfactory receptors, all right, to the olfactory receptors. And this, this nasal um, cavity is open into the nasal, into the pharynx to be, it's in contact with the nasopharynx via the cavity. The cavity is the opening of the nasal cavity, and we have between we have those muscles. We have the superior, middle, and, and inferior nasal meatus, which are a passageway that produce air turbulences. All right, to 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 trap any any particles, any debris that is in the mucus to warm and humidify the, um, the incoming air. And also, I said, to bring the olfactory stimuli to the olfactory receptors. The floor of the nasal cavity is made of those hard, those hard, uh, hard palate. And it's extended. You see, this is hard. This is the hard palate that separates the nose from the mouth. And it's extended with the soft palate that will divide actually the soft. More you are going in, it's more soft. It's going to develop, uh, separate. Sorry, I have a hard time talking this morning. Separate the nasopharynx from the rest of the pharynx. Okay. 
remember what we learned in 2401 that the nasal septum is made of um, the perpendicular uh, pla uh, plate of the ethmoid and the vomer. And those are the uh, those are the uh, passageway that bring the air, the inferior nasal mucus, that's the inferior concave, that's the middle concave with the middle nasal mucus, those passageway, and then the superior concave with the superior nasal mucus. Okay. Nose is is very um very very. Nose bleeding is very common because of a lot of vascularizations in the nasal cavity. Okay, we move to the next structures, which is the pharynx. The pharynx is a chamber shared also. We are going to study it also when we study the digestive system. So it's also part of the digestive system as well as the respiratory system. I remember that it extends um, between, uh, it's the concave that separates the nasal uh, cavity to the pharynx, right? And it's divided in three parts. We have the nasal pharynx that is separated from the nasal cavity by this uh, structure, this entrance, we call that the quani. And we have a lot of muscles here that will allow the, the stimuli to go to the olfactory receptors and to clean any air coming through, all right? Remember that this is the air coming here to go through all those passage airway to go through the lung, all right? Where the gas exchange will happen. The nasopharynx is the superior portion of the pharynx. It contain, you see it, it contain the auditory opening tube, and it contain also the pharyngeal tensile. Right? The oral pharynx, you see it, look at that. He is in connect direct connections with the oral cavity. The oral. This is why we call it oral or nasal contacts with the nose through this opening. This one is in direct contact, the oral pharynx. And then we have the laryngeal pharynx, which is the inferior portion of the pharynx. He lay down in between the, um, the hyloid bone and the entrance to the esophagus is between the heliwit bone and the, infer and the uh, superior part of the esophagus. The airflow from the pharynx to the larynx through those, the glitis, very important passageway to the glitis. This is like slight like opening between the vocal cord. We are going to see six types of cartilages. Some of them are unpaired, there are three, and the three others are paired. The three unpaired cartilage, we have the tyroid cartilage, the cricoid cartilage, and the epiglitis. Those are unpaired. Cricoid, tyroid, epiglitis. And the epiglitis, you are going to see that is protecting this, this opening, this uh, glucitis. And they are, both of them are yellow in tyroid and cricoid, except the epiglitis is an elastic cartilage. So let's look at those cartilage. We have the two with cartilage is huge, all right? It's very big. This is where what we call the uh, Adam apple, the anterior surface for it. And is attached to the heliwit bones 
and is attached to the epiglottis, and he also is attached to the smaller laryngine uh, cartilages. The cricoid cartilage is attached to the thyroid cartilage, and he articulates with the arthenoid cartilage. The epiglottis is the one that is protecting those glottis and is attached to the, uh, the thyroid cartilage and the helioid bones. This is the posterior view and you are going, this is where the vocal ligament exists. This is where the glottis exists, right? He prevents actually is protecting the glottis, and he prevents food and liquid entering from the respiratory tract. Did you ever said that um, you don't talk uh, when you are uh, when you are uh, mashing food, right? And the three pair of the smaller cartilage in the larynx are the arthenoid cartilage. You see, they are in pair. The corniculate cartilage and the kiniform cartilage. We are we, for some reason I don't know why we don't have the legend for it. The corniculate cartilage and the arthenoid cartilage, they are playing function on opening and closing the glottis. And they, they play a role also in predictions of the sound because they are protecting also the vocal ligaments over there. We move to the next the trachea. Trachea is um, produce the airflow, right? It's a windpipe. If you remember, the epithelium is made of um, a pseudostratified uh, ciliated epithelium, and the seals are uh, those extensions uh, from uh, the cell that uh, uh, very thin that the, the, the are going to move some of the debris out from the airway to not be, uh, and especially also to not swallow on those big debris, right? And we have those special mucus that they are secreted by the mucus uh, gland or what we call tracheal gland that produce mucus secretions. Uh, very important to trap also uh, those, uh, those pathogens. It's made purely of yelling cartilage again. Um, so when you inhale, it create like a vacuum to keep the airway open. And uh, the histology for it, I just said, anything that is blue in, in from now on, anything that you are seeing like sky blue, this is the, the cartilage, right? So we have the cartilage, tracheal cartilage, which is yellow cartilage. We have the tracheal gland that secrete those mucus. And we have uh, the surrounding lemon and the cartilage. When you are inhaling, it, it will relax those lemon to let uh, the air flow in. You remember that this is like a wind pop. is the one that um, the air uh, produce air flow. So when it's relaxed, the lumen is very wilder and the air flu increase. And the structure is so funny, it's not completely closed. You see it over here, all right? It's like a big C and puff. It's not completely circular like the esophagus over here. You see it, the structures of it is really closed, kind of circular, all right? This one is like a C. And you have an opening end over here. This end is made of what we call, uh, it's not completely complete. You see, we have the cartilage going like a C puff and it stop. 
and he is connected but what we call annular ligaments and also a trachealis muscle very very um, uh, funny structures of the uh, trachea so the trachea is the is actually something also uh, very interesting he's the origin of the pulmonary tree or the bronchial tree he is going to be branch uh, that um, they are made of 15 to 20 i told you as a, they have a form like a c because the cartilage is not completely circular but is uh, is have some end ligament and some uh, trachealis muscles and some lunar ligament am i pronouncing it good annular ligament sorry so they are like a c they have like 15 to 20 c-shaped tracheal cartilage okay they are um they are um they are stiffened uh, uh, tracheal wall and protect the airway but there are some things very um uh very and they are not continuous they are discontinuous this is why they are like a c form we have this uh those this is not continuous so this is just a repetition we have this annular ligament and trachealis so it's not in continuity um and this allow distortion of the tracheal wall when swollen very important very important structures uh so um this is the origin this is the source for the bronchial tree all right and uh, and you are going to see that um the tracheal tree when you go um if you compare the right to the left you will see that the right is more um it have um, like uh, ten more bronchiopulmonary segment than the left uh, part so uh, b before i move i uh, this is why i was hesitating if i have to talk about it i saw some structures here very very interesting which is before i forget um this carina um you know when you cough a lot sometimes you feel like it's hurting it's hurt when you cough you said that to your doctor when you cough a lot like me i am an asthmatic person and they cough a lot so because we when you cough a lot we hurt this very sensitive area in uh, within um by the end of the when the brain when the trachea is going to be branched we have this area that is have a lot of lot of nerve ending uh in this ventilation tube uh, it's very very sensitive um so this carina this what we call the carina of, of the trachea that have a lot of nerve ending and this is why it hurt when you cough a lot when you put a lot of pressure on it so from this carina this carina you see it's going to be branch is going to branch into left and right with branches going into the lung we know that the right lung is have more lobe than the left lung so automatically which one is going to be branching uh, not only wilder is going bigger is going to be of course the right this is why the right lung has more bronchiopulmonary segments than the left bronchus. So the right main bronchus is not only wilder, as you can see, look at that, it's not only wilder than this, but also steeper is is stiffened. 
if you inhale a debris, it's more likely to go down into the right lung because it's wilder. All right. And once in the inside of the lung, they will become low bar lungs, low bar bronchial, sorry. And if we go down, I'm going to move to this. If you go down, look at it. If you go down all the way, you will find the level where the respiratory, uh, that's the respiratory zone. This is where the gas exchange happens. All the way up. This is the conducting zone. This is where the all air flow happen. Air flow happen. And we are coming down, down, down until we came into those microscopic little structures. This is the respiratory zone. This is where the air will be exchanged. Those structures which allow the air gas exchange, they are very microscopic. They are very thin. They are circular. If you look at them, they are little circle like a little grape. And when we have a circle, that means we have more surface area, right? And those, oh, you are going to see them either in the right are on the left side of the line. And they are becoming circular. It's a funny, they are little circles, so that means they have more surface area to allow. It's a function, which is the gas exchange. We need a lot of oxygen. We need a gas exchange so we can survive. So we have those conducting system, the trachea, branching to the left and right, left and right main bronchus, right? Which going to um, branch into the lobar bronchus, lobar bronchus branch into segmental bronchus, then the smaller bronchi, and the smaller bronchi will go to bronchial, and the terminal bronchioles. And the terminal bronchioles, this is, they are attached, those grape circular structures, we are alveoli. Each segmental bronchi form about 6,500 terminal bronchial. That's a lot. Each one will form 6,500 terminal. That's a lot. And not only they are going to be a lot, but they are also circular forms, so they can have higher surface area to do its function of gas exchange. Very, very interesting, isn't it? So I repeat the trachea branch into the right and left. Right is not only wilder. I don't know if I have it. I have it over here. It's not only wilder, but it's stiffened also. 
So if you inhale it, debris, it's more likely to go down into the right lung. And at this level, I mean, it will be um, uh, going into from the right, left bronchi. That's sorry, that's the conducting zone. And move if I move down, I will go to the respiratory zone. This is where gas exchange happens. So from the right to left, bronchus move into lobar because I go inside of lobes. So go into lobar, bronchus, segmental bronchi. smaller bronchi, bronchial, terminal bronchioles. And each terminal bronchial, it's about 6,000 bar segmental, by, term, by uh, segmental bronchial. Before I, um, I study the structures of those alveoli, those uh, uh, grape-like structures, let's um, talk about uh, do a little bit about the gross anatomy of the lung. Uh, the lung, I mean, we have left and right, right? And you remember the heart, the heart lay down on the left side, right, more. So here we have, this is why the left lung have this cardiac notch. And the right lung is much bigger and have the three lobes. We have superior lobe, middle lobe, and the inferior lobe, while the left lung have only superior and inferior lobe. And they are separated in the superior and the middle lobe. They are separated by the horizontal um, deep fissure and the superior and the middle and the right lung are separated from the inferior by the oblique fissure. We have superior and inferior, it's always separated by the oblique fissure. The, we don't have horizontal fissure because we don't have middle uh, lobe, okay? And we have also those entrance that they are very, um, very, it's, it's like a groove that uh, have um, a lot of vessels, nerves, and lymphatic that allows the passage of the main, uh, that allow the passage of the main bronchi, uh, pulmonary vessels, nerves, and lymphatic. We call that the helum of the lung, the helum of the lung. So you have the bronchus, you have the pulmonary artery, pulmonary veins, okay? in the both part you have it as well in the right as well as in the left all right so let's re remind you how the 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 oxygen is um how the blood supply the lung all right the respiratory exchange surface receive deoxygenated blood from the pulmonary artery all right sorry that's the branch of the pulmonary artery and that's um, a branch of the vein. And it's really, we have around the, this is a smooth muscle around the terminal bronchi, around it. So we have, the, what you see here, yellow, it's nerves. The vein are um, those. blue and the red are those arteries and you have a lot of capillaries around those grape lake uh, alveoli you remember that is segmental bronchi give me like 6500 uh, uh, terminal bronchial that the if i go back and each terminal bronchi is about six bronchial, all right? Oh, some things that they forget. Let's focus on this very, very, that's very interesting. 
Uh, when you go from the conducting system through the respiratory uh, zone, from the conducting, sorry, conducting zone to the respiratory zone, what you are noticing, you are noticing that the degree of the cartilage is less, 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 less. And the muscle, smooth muscle, is increasing, is the opposite, is going up. The more you're going down, is going up, up. At the point, like when you are at the alveoli, when you are at the terminal bronchial, and it's terminal bronchial, you have those grapes on it, you are going to see that there are no cartilage, more smooth muscles on, on it. So you are, it's dominated by the smooth muscle. So let's continue over here. Capillary networks surround those um, uh, each alveoli, right? It's surrounded because they are very thin. This is a squamous epithelium. Uh, we will talk about the structures for those uh, alveoli, right? And they are surrounded. Look at that. A lot of capillaries. A lot of capillaries. So the, 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 the epithelium for those capillaries are thin. The epithelium for those alveoli are very thin. And they exchange gas. So the capillary, so the oxygen uh, rich blood from the alveoli capillaries is carried through the pulmonary vein to the left atrium, if you remember, right? And the capillaries supplied by the bronchial arteries provide oxygen and nutrient. Nutrient, uh, nutrient to the conducting passageway. And I want you to notice, I'm going to zoom on it. On those cavities, the lung is made of a plural uh, uh, layers. They have a two. We have the visceral pleura that is cover the outer surface of the lung, right? It's completely in contact with those uh, great, those uh, alveoli, the visceral. And we have the parietal uh, pleura that uh, it's the inner surface of the thoracic wall. And in between them, we have this pleural cavity, which is um, this pleural cavity that's um, full of um, pleural fluid. That's um, it, it's not really too much. It's not a lot of fluid, I, um, but uh, it's provide. It's enough to provide the lubrications and the reduce the surface tensions and uh, assist in expansions and recall of the lung. So the parietal pleura actually, it's, um, if you remember, it's going to be completely in the inferior part of the lung. So it's in contact of the superior face of the diaphragm. Um, all right. And the, the pleura that consists of these two layers actually help um, holding the lung in place. So if I go, so picture. I was hoping to have a gentleman picture with all these floral cavities, but this is this uh, pleura, this around the the lung. It's to hold the lung um, in place. So um, I will move to the. I told you that I want you to to study this um, structures, this alveoli structures. A very very interesting.
we have, uh, I mean, those alveoli very squamous, simple squamous epithelium. Um, this is, if you look at them, we have different things here in this alveolar organization where the gasic chains happen. So the epithelium is a simple squamous. <coughs> we have um, some macrophages, alveolar macrophages that uh, eliminate any debris. We have um, a lot of endothelial cells capillaries because, of course, this is where the gasic change happen, right? We have those pneumocyte type 2 um, alveoli cells, those little brownish structures over here. They secrete a surfactant, and the surfactant um, is going to reduce the tension if you try, um, if you, 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 in, you inhale too much. I mean, if you force yourself to inhale, it's going to reduce this tension. Um, Those surfactants is oily, it's lipid secretions, um, and they um, they can They are very important because if you force to inhale, inhale, you will. Um, I try to explain it to you very simply. You will protect the lung or the alveoli to not collapse after each inhale inhalations. After each exhale. Exha exhalations and force inhale, it will protect the alveoli to not collapse. The type 1 pneumocyte that you are seeing here it's the site for the gasic change. And this is uh, patrolled by this alveolar macrophage, making sure that the alveoli is coming in, no pathogen. And we have those pneumocyte type 2 that secrete this, uh, this oily secretion surfactant. This is all to make the exchange gas go in very softly and smoothly. Again. So this is the squamous, simple squamous epithelium. And we have those teeny, 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 teeny alveoli. Making it big. Alveoli sac, alveoli contact, arterioles.
the respirations um, include the two integrated process, the external respiration that all the process involve exchange of the oxygen and the CO2 with the external environment and the internal respiration that uh, which is the cell respiration within the cell. It uptake the oxygen and the CO2 by the cell. I love this slide. You are see the, the H terminal bronchi branches to form respiratory bronchioles or bronchioles. And they are connected to the alveoli along the alveoli duct. All right. And the alveolar duct and alveolar sac, which is the common chamber that connects too many individual alveoli, those little grape circular. Each alveoli has an extensive network capillaries around it, and it's surrounded by elastic fibers. Again, gas exchange, which is the blood bar barrier at the alveoli, so you have the red blood cells, you have alveolar airspace over here. You have type 2, plumocyte, type 2, type 1, sarcophages. So this is alveoli. And this is the capillary. And this is the capillary lumen. And they're on the thallium, and look at that, they are in contact. Tiny with tiny, making the gas exchange. This is the nucleus of the endothelial cells of the capillary. we we'll talk about this. So now let's talk about the pulmonary um, uh, breathing cycle, the lung breathing cycle. We have pulmonary ventilation within the breathing, which is the physical uh, movement of the air into, which call inspirations or inhalations, and out, which is expiration or exhalations, and provide alveoli ventilations, all right? And this is depend on the atmospheric pressure, which is ATM, that has uh, several important physical effects. Um, I want you to know this, that the air move from high pressure to low pressure, routine that, okay? Before even we go to mechanic of breathing, the mechanism of the breathing or the mechanic breathing of the lung, let's never forget that the air move from the high pressure to low pressure, all right? So the mechanics of breathing to, to the way we do, I mean, so in the lung, the air is going to move uh, from high pressure to low pressure. And the way um, to we do this is by, um, how we can make, how, how the lung is going to do her ventilation, her breathing. The air is moving from high pressure to low pressure. Is a plane with the volume because we are going to obey to our pressure volume law, which said that um, the volume uh, is uh, inverse of the pressure. So if the, the pressure is high, it's less volume. If the pressure is low, is high volume. So we are going to play, so the lung, so um, in another way, or the lung to be able to breathe, all right, you have to play on the volume inside of those lung. And this happened with expansions, uh, contractions of the diaphragm or the rib cage.
So we have the external, we talk about that the external respirations, it's, um, it's between the lung um, and the blood and the internal expirations, uh, respirations between the blood and the cell, all right? And this, um, just remind you what is the boil law, define the relationship between the gas and the volume, as you can see, it's inversely. Uh, so when, in another word, if you decrease the volume of a container, the collusions between particles that they are inside of this, uh, containers are going to increase the pressure and if you increase the volume um, there are going to be fewer collisions and the fire the pressure is less so this is why the pressure following the boil's law is in inverse sully volume so retain also this and retain also that the air is going to move from high pressure to the low pressure so what make the lung is going to breathe so we have, as I said, it have to do with um, uh, the way you have to change the volume in in your thoracic cage, and this happened with expansions and contractions of the diaphragm or the rib cage. So the rest is going to be so easy. So the rest, ventilation, which is the respiration, say it's breathe. It consists of an inspiration, inhalations, and expiration, exhalations. All right. Now let's get started. So um, as the diaphragm is contracted, or the rib cage is elevated, the volume of the thoracic cavity increase and the air move into the lung. The anterior movement of the ribs and the sternum as they are elevated result to the outward swing of the rise bucket handle. At rest, the pressure outside and inside, outside of the lung and inside of the lung is the same. So when the rib cage and the diaphragm are at the rest, the pressure are the same equal, there are no air movement. And the pleural fluid, it reduces these fractions, i.e. And all the muscles, the pulmonary muscles, are relaxed. Relax. Now, inhalations or inspirations, what's going to happen? You are breathing in some air, and the air is go from high blood pressure to low blood pressure. So he go. The pressure outside should be higher than the pressure inside. To have the air coming in the lung, the pressure outside of the lung should be higher than inside of the lung. The lung have to play with the volume inside. And the muscles that they are going to play a role there in these inspirations are the diaphragm is the most important muscles. So when it's contract, the abdominal contents are pushed down, look at them. They are pushing down and the ribs are left up and outward. When the diaphragm is contracted, it push up those muscles. The volume of the thoracic cavity increase. The external, they are also one of primary muscles that they are involving in these inhalations, are used only during exercise. 
and they are those muscles that they are going to be up push left upward and outward up and out they are the ster uh, sternocleidomastoid muscle scalene muscles the pectoralis minors and serratus anterior When the diaphragm and the external intercostal muscle during exercise, they are contracted, they are pushed down. This will increase the volume. How? By in upward and outward those muscles, those accessory muscles. What's going to happen? So here the lung play on the volume, right? So we make the air coming from outside to inside. It increase her volume. Now to do the expirations, exhalations, sorry. All right. It's normally passive, right? The rib cage return to its original positions. Um, the diaphragm gets relaxed passively. Because the wall um, the lung wall is um, is elastic, and he returned to his position after inspirations. The abdominal muscles compress the abdomen cavity, push the diaphragm up, and push the air out of the lung. The pressure within the lung increase and the air move out. And those intercostal muscles, they are uh, pulling the rep down and inward. If you see, they are inward and down those accessory respiratory muscle. Most of it, the intercostal muscles and the rectus abdominis. Very easy. Avoid, that's obey to the boil law that say that the pressure is the anniversary of the volume and also the fact that the pressure, the air move from high pressure to low pressure. So we talk about all this. Now we are going to talk about um, the respiratory rate, capacities, and volumes, okay? Respiratory systems adapt to changing oxygen demand by varying the number of the breath per minute, which is the respiratory rate, and also the amount of the air per breath, which is the total volumes. The respiratory minute volume is the amount of the air moved per minute is calculated by respiratory rate multiplied by the tidal volume. That will measure the pulmonary ventilations. So the inhalations, the intra-pulmonary pressure is low. 
the pressure, remember the air go from high pressure to low pressure. If the air is coming inside of the lung, the intrapleural pressure is very low, the volume is high, so a lot of the inhalations is going to go down the volume, the tidal volume. Remember what is tidal volume? Is the air move per breath, all right? As soon as it's getting down, the pressure in the intrapleural and in the lung is going to include, increase, and this happened passively. This is an exhalation. Okay. Only um, some inhale air reach the alveolar exchange surface, not all of it. The volume remaining in conducting passage is called anatomic dead space. The air that reach the alveoli, alveoli ventilation, VA, is the amount each minute. It's the amount of the air reaching the alveoli each minute. Whatever left behind in the conducting passage is called anatomic dead space. Respiratory rate, how we calculate the alveoli ventilation is the respiratory rate mitigated by the uh, difference between the tidal volume and the anatomic dead space. The air that enter in the lung minus the air that has been left in the passageway, passage uh, zone. I like to see this in a picture. So this is the tidal volume. This is the amount of the air move into and out of the lung in one breath, right? The inspiratory reserve volume, which is the additional of the air that can be inhaled, the total uh, inspiratory reserve volume is the, how do I say it, the total capacity, uh, the total capacity of the lung minus the total capacity of the air, total capacity of the lung minus the the volume of the air in the lung at the end of the normal inspirations. The total capacity this means that uh, we have the reserve of the volume that we can uh, tape into as uh, a tidal volume increase with exercise and, uh, um, and uh, activities. The expiratory reserve volume, which is the amount of the air in the lung after maximum exhalations, uh, this is uh, this one is actually the difference between the volume of the air left in the lung and the, con and the normal expiration versus the, the maximum expirations. 
what's that mean? This mean that we have a reserve of volume which can we can tape into when the total volume increase with exercise or activity. Residual volume which is the, the volume left in the lung at the end of maximum expirations. Um, actually, this residual volume, you cannot uh, voluntarily exhale from your, from, from your lung. And as this residual volume cannot be exhaled, the volume can be estimated through gas dilution technique and, uh, and the use of um, helium in uh, integrated, in an in, aspire in air. So uh, since we do not metabolize uh, the helium, this is how we can figure out. So we have recapitulations. We have uh, we can actually perform um, a respiratory performance and volume um, relationship uh, using uh, spirometer. So we have the tidal volume, which is the the amount of the air move in and out of the lung per breath. That's the tidal volumes. Usually it's around 500 milliliter. We have the expiratory volume, which is um, uh, the um, expiratory volume, which is the amount of um, this is a reserve actually expiratory. It's the amount of the volume that we have as a reserve. Uh, that we can take um, when our tidal volume increase after exercise or uh, activities. This is during the expiration. During the inspirations, we have also a reserve that we call inspiratory uh, volume that we can also take when uh, we do increase the exercise or activities during inhalations. And we have residual volume. This residual volume is um, this is cannot be exhaled. This is what is left. He is um, It is the volume that is left after maximum expirations. This is um, the volume that we cannot voluntarily um, exhale from our lung. Um, beside of those volumes, we have also capacities that interfere with the, those lung volumes. We have the vital cap capacity, the vital capacity, if you see it over here, the vital capacity, which is uh, the total uh, usable volume of the lung, which, uh, which is under voluntary control. And uh, 
this amount or this um, value does not include uh, the entire lung volume uh, as it's not possible to breathe all the air out of the lung. That's the fetal capacity. We have the inspiratory capacity, which is, uh, if you see it, that's the sum of the tidal volume plus the inspiratory reserve. We have also the functional residual capacity, which is the total volume of the air left in the lung at the conclusion of the normal resting expirations. And this include external reserve volume as a value, see it, go here, and the residual volume. And we have another capacity, which is the total line capacity. As the residual volume cannot expire, can, we cannot take it out of the lung, right? Plus the vital capacity. The vital capacity plus the residual volumes that we cannot take out of the lung will, it's as value the total lung capacity. And if you look at the numbers and you add those, you are going to see it over here. So almost the end of this chapter. So, so remember this, that the external respiration, the blood arriving in the pulmonary arteries has low oxygen pressure and high CO2 pressure. And the oxygen will move through um, gradient concentrations regarding the pressure. So who will enter the blood and the CO2 will leave the blood. And the rapid exchange will happen until they reach the equilibrium. So this is a big pictures over here. So we have the pulmonary, alveolar, capillary, and this is the alveoli. So you see that the remember is bringing low on oxygen higher on CO2 and the vein will bring back higher oxygen lower CO2 and uh, over here the oxygen will go from and the diffusion of the oxygen will go from higher to low and the CO2 will go from lower again, the CO2. The oxygen will enter the blood. Because the pressure is higher, slower over here. Right? And the CO2 will leave the blood. It's higher over here, lower over here. You go down gradient of concentrations, okay? From higher to low, higher to low, higher to low. And the alveolar will have higher in the end because of the oxygen entering and the CO2 leaving will have higher oxygens, a lower uh, CO2.
and from the capillary to the tissue. Oxygen is higher, lower over here, so we will go down gradient of concentration. The CO2 will go down gradient concentrations, and the circles will continue. So now I have my blood vessels is very rich on CO2, lower on oxygen. And they go over here, lower on oxygen, higher on CO2. My air is coming higher on oxygen in my alveoli, right? So the oxygen will go from higher to low, CO2 from higher to low. My blood now is higher on oxygen, it's lower on CO2, go around the tissue, depose the oxygen. And take off CO2. All right, and that's end my lecture. Thank you so much. I will see you for the next lecture.